Tonight, the fast and furious business of growing up in Australia. Over the fence is six and out. You don't cry when you go to the doctor. The girl with the most dolls wins. And you never, ever dob. You are a naughty boy. Forget about the idea of being seen and not heard. For Aussie kids, our century has been one big adventure. Whoa there, Silver! Pick a year, just one year in our century, and you'll find somebody saying, what's wrong with our kids? They won't learn and they certainly won't listen. The fact is, of course, there's nothing wrong with our children. Nothing that time won't fix anyway. But as parents, we tend to worry too much about them. And maybe that's what parents are supposed to do. For these children, though, they probably think that school is boring. <laughs> it's something that has to be endured rather than enjoyed. Yet, in the blink of an eye, they'll come to realise that these days are the best years of their life. It's 1941, and the Kelly gang is still at large. A backyard hold-up caught on home movie. And that's the pretty girl next door. A mean bush ranger, but a bit camera shy. It's always the same. Boys will be boys, and girls will... Well, they'll do their own thing. Under the bamboo, under the tree. True love for you, my darling, true love for me. When we get married and have a family, a boy for you and a girl for me. At the turn of the century, you could leave school at the age of 12, and most did. At the weekend, there was nothing better than the fair, and nothing more refreshing than a cool cocktail of raspberry vinegar, mixed with lots of water. This little Bo Peep still has her sheep. It's 1920, and the little girl is Helen Hughes, the daughter of Prime Minister Billy Hughes. Ringlet curls are all the go, and kids of every age are reading Norman Lindsay's The Magic Pudding to any doll that will listen. Not so many years ago, wooden sword and kerosene tin armour were the fashion. Nowadays, it's the cowboy suit and the six-shooter which open the door to adventure. We're ambushed. Make for that rock. Let them have it. By the 1940s, the rules were changing. The school leaving age was now 15, and American culture was now starting to rub off on our children. Whoa there, Silver! <laughs> King Arthur, Cowboys and Indians, or a game of cricket. It made no difference. The usual playground was the street. Go and fox it. It was a different lingo way back then. But street cricket was getting dangerous. By the 1950s, the motor car was killing or injuring more than 1,000 Australian children every year. That was close. I nearly hit you. Hey, aren't you John Bradman? Yes, that's right, laddie. Come on. Now listen, boys, you know I like playing cricket as well as you do. The voice was high-pitched, but it was the face of a hero a man with a road safety message. But if the streets were now out of bounds, the kids needed somewhere else to play. We give broad acres for our sheep to graze, and this is where some children play. In the 1950s and 60s, community playgrounds started springing up, along with a national fitness and safety program. The road toll fell, and the cities became safer for our children. 
A great pioneer movement, the Far West Homes, brings hundreds of children from the distant inland to the sea. It's their first sight, too, of a big city. Hello, kids. How are you? Hey. How do you like the big city, seeing it for the first time, eh? Pretty good sort of fashion. Mm. Is it like it is way back where you come from? Oh, no. How do you mean? How is it different? Hmm? Oh, well, here, you see, when you want to go anywhere, yes. you have to get all dressed up. Mm -hmm. Well, up home, that's more really well. You just have to put a shirt on, a pair of shorts, and wash your feet and go wherever you want it. <laughs> I see. Once you wash your feet, you're off, eh? Yes. <laughs> Aussie kids from the bush and from the city went barefoot for much of our century. Shoes were just an optional extra. But how times have changed. The dress thong has been superseded by shoes for superstars at super prices. New shoes, new shoes, red and pink and blue shoes. Gentlemen, in introducing to you, little Miss Wyoway. What a darling. <laughs> if you've got a movie camera, then point it at the children. Because we all know they grow up too fast. Suddenly, they're off to school. And watch Mum. She's probably going inside to cry. At the time of Federation, Australia boasted a proud school record. Nine out of ten of our primary school children could read and write. But only the lucky few went on to high school. In the 1920s, it seemed the focus of our education was the three R's. Reading, writing and royalty. Our history books told us more about England's past than Australia's. If there's one thing that's unique about Australian education, it's the swim school. Until recent times, basic fitness was never much of a problem. But back in the 1920s, we discovered that children's health was. For example, nine out of ten Australian children had decaying teeth. His gear may not be as elaborate as in a city surgery, but the results are just as good. It was the parents who needed some lessons. Look at little Susie over there. Come here, Susie. Now, in this case, you will notice her chest is very flat and her shoulders are round. And she doesn't breathe with her chest properly. During the hard times in the 1930s, we filled our kids up with bread and dripping. It was one way for a battling family to make the Sunday roast last the whole week. And back then, we didn't know as much about good nutrition. And after the war, well, that all changed. The children are given an Oslo lunch. And do they like it? Oh, do they? All right. They call it the Oslo diet. In the 1940s, the Norwegians had to tell us what to feed our children. This little lady seems suspicious. Ah, it's all right. It was high fibre bread, fruit, ham and milk. Now, why couldn't we think of that? Good luck and God bless you, little man. Good luck, little doctor. But back in the 30s, at least one Australian had jumped on the milk wagon. A retiring state politician by the name of Dr Maloney was at least looking after Victoria's children. When the election comes next time, pledge every candidate that if he is returned, he will vote to give full free milk to every child who wants it. By 1951, the Menzies government was buying free milk for all Australian school children. It was every school's cardinal rule. The milk bottles always sat in the sun. Children, I know it's hard to concentrate. And inside the Aussie classroom, there were no fans and no luck. Oh, yes, Wayne? Could we go for a swim, sir? You know the rule, Wayne. Nobody's let off school until the temperature's over 110. Uh, what does it read now? 108, sir. But once the bell rang, it was go for it. Three hours till tea, and no time to waste. Oh, 
Here's a dizzy display of dexterity that wouldn't be out of place on the stage. The Americans sold the hula hoop to the world, but we invented it in the 1950s. It's the old story. And have a look at five-year-old Christine Goldsworthy. How good is she? And it seems there's no limit to what can be done with a twist and a twirl from a cute little girl. Aussie kid, then you had a billy cart. If you were lucky enough to also own a billy goat, well, you were off and running in the mad, mad world of goat cart racing. In the early 1900s, Rockhampton was the capital of this junior harness racing. It was outlawed everywhere else except Queensland. The fear was that some people might start punting on the kids and their billy goats. And then where would we be? So without the family goat to pull them, Aussie kids had to find a hill to race their billy carts. And they always did. Any of you boys been in a billy cart derby before? <laughs> this is Jim Banks, who in 1922 created Ginger Megs, the most Aussie kid of all. His newspaper sponsored the biggest billy cart derby in Australia. Now, what's the pedigree of your carts, no? By Pram Wheels, our soapbox. <laughs> 30,000 spectators lined the streets. Noel Eddington in flying feet, I can't lose. Whew, must have touched 90. What do you say, Noel? It was a great race, and the, and the best man did win. I'm very sorry for all the other young kids who uh, didn't win, but better luck next time. Anyhow, my mum got a, frock, a new frock out of it. Organised events like this were meant to keep a restless generation in check and out of trouble. The natural enemy of a kid growing up in Australia is boredom. Now what's he been doing? Well, I found him playing truant and making use of himself. Blowing the horn of somebody else's car. You are a naughty boy. And have a look at this family classic. The little girl at the top of the screen starts to cry and all of a sudden, everyone looks guilty. And if you're a boy and you've got a hose, well, use it. Mm, I don't do that. Now, don't wet the little girl like that. Aha, uh -huh. here's trouble. Always there's trouble when a boy's terrific amount of creative energy bursts its way to the surface. Back then, child psychology was simple. If you want to keep a boy out of trouble, buy him a Meccano set. For 40 years, Meccano, with a range of sets to suit all ages and pockets, has provided a creative outlet for boys, giving them a guide in life. For our girls, the answer was always a bigger bride doll. But in 1959, along came a liberated new role model. May I help you, ladies? We'd like to see the newest Barbie club. Of course, Barbie, the famous teenage fashion model doll. May I arrange a showing of her wardrobe? Oh, yeah, we'd love it. A sign of the changing times. Barbie wasn't interested in a glory box. She just wanted a cupboard full of clothes. I never bothered with romance or gave any boy a second glance on them. I met Ken. Still, every kid's best mate was always the family pet. Eleven-year-old Billy Jennings of Chelma near Brisbane refused to allow a paralyzed right leg to interfere with his cricket. But fieldsmen were scarce, so Billy called on his canine friends for help. Billy Jennings had infantile paralysis, polio. Billy trained the dogs himself so he couldn't complain when they cut off his boundaries. In the 1930s and again in the 1950s, there was always somebody at school with polio. Many were crippled for life. Then, a medical breakthrough. Dr. Jonas Salk made world headlines in America when it was announced that trials of his poliomyelitis vaccine had proved successful. There was always one kid who smiled and pretended it didn't hurt. But everyone else knew that it did, even when you didn't look. Still, the needles work miracles. 
1956, the year of the Melbourne Olympics, 1,000 new polio cases were reported. By the early 60s, the disease had become a thing of the past. He's trying his best to be a spot. And a shot in the arm was also how hundreds of so-called English war orphans were welcomed to Australia in 1947. It's not so unlike the old country after all. We now know that some of these children had parents and families. They weren't orphans. The British government paid five shillings a week to board them in Australia. Many finished up in farm schools as cheap labour. But the newsreels didn't mention that life for these children was tough and often tormenting. There's all round tuition in elementary handling of livestock and the lessons literally start on the ground floor. They'd come from different countries and different cultures. But Aboriginal children and English war orphans had one thing in common. From the 1920s to the 1970s, Aboriginal children were systematically dumped in foster homes. These kids certainly weren't orphans. They were stolen from their families. Some were trained to be servants and stockmen. Most worked as unpaid labourers. Whatever the government's reasons, there was no excuse for the stolen generation. And so far, no apology. For much of this century, Aussie boys marched through their teenage years as scouts. In the 1930s, it was a jamboree instead of a rock concert that dragged them in. 10,000 Boy Scouts mustered for this jamboree. It's hot work marching and listening to speeches. But anything the boys can do, well, the girl guides could match. They started in 1910, only two years after the Scouts. And by the 1950s, they were competing in the backyard Bob a Job market. Sydney's girl guides start Willing Shilling Week in a drive to raise funds to extend their movement. There's a standard charge of a shilling a job, whether it's washing Fido or taking little Angeline out while Mum catches up on the housework. Of course, children have always been put to work. During World War II, with adults, the kids understood that this time it had to be done as never before. Boys of a Port Melbourne public school give up most of their spare time to important war work. They are making camouflage nets, of which our armies have tremendous need. The Defence Department supplies materials for lads the elbow grease. They hope to see Hitler slip on it. Oh, boys, they're trying to shut it all, Hitler. This film was shot during the Great War in 1916. To these kids, trench warfare was a game and no one really got hurt. Like all children, they were rehearsing for the next stage of their lives. Rehearsing for the space race and for the America's Cup. For big business. And we practice our diplomacy skills. If we get picked on, Hanadi say, you wait, and we'll go around the corner and Hanadi would bash him up, you know, till they're bleeding or something and go home and we'll wander off like there's nothing happened. We discover the value of brick and mortar and enterprise bargaining. And what's Sandy going to bring you for Christmas? Call me to a card. And I want those three zeroes. And I want Matchbox super fast. And we learn to appreciate the finer things in life. A lot of the pictures tonight, in fact the pictures in this series, have come from your home movies. And one man, Douglas Albion, sent us this rusty film can that he found under the house of his late brother, Wall. He said it hadn't been opened for about 70 years. Makes it a bit like a buried treasure. Because it's rare to find film of that vintage. They used to shoot on nitrate, which is fragile and highly flammable. So we had no idea what was going to be in here, if anything. What we found were fantastic pictures of young Wall's fifth birthday party, which was held right here in this backyard. So what you're about to see is a time capsule from about 1921, just after the First World War, of a magic moment in a little boy's life. A lucky little boy in the early part of this century. <laughs> 